What are you doing out in the snow? It's 32 degrees below zero Celsius. And my dad is working hard, looking beyond the extents of hypothermia, hypochondria, and all the elements combined, he works to build a fence. A true servant, a true worker, a true exhibit of hard work and ethics. This is my father, in whom I am well pleased. Hey, it's me again. Does your job still suck? Are you still mad at your job and therefore life sucking? Then you should join the Bitcoin podcast Slack, where the people there don't suck, or at least their jobs don't. So, in essence, their lives don't either. Join the Slack. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin podcast. Uh, Sorry, I just watched. Is that a voice? Um, what is that? Yeah, I just watched Star Wars. Well, I didn't watch it. Oh, I watched the thumb- that's what it is. The thumbnails of Star Wars Episode One, and the guy that's like, "Hidden money is no good here." Because I know I knew that way voice I, from somewhere. That's the way I feel about crypto lately. I'm like, "Hey, do you take Ether?" And they're like, <laughs> I'm like "Oh God, stop it, stop it, stop." It. Anyways, uh, my name is uh, D, and I'm the host. Talks first. I am Corey Petty, and I usually talk second. Mm -hmm. I'm Jesse Broke, and I'm talking third. Yep. We tried to kick it counterclockwise on y'all. You say clockwise? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise matter. Counterclockwise. Clockwise do matter. (laughs) Um, Oh, man. I've lost so much grace with the elders. So anyway, so let's, let's, let's get right into it. Welcome to the Bitcoin podcast. This is a show where we kind of talk about Bitcoin. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're late to the Bitcoin podcast, you're in on the tail end of uh, what is, can only be seen as historical greatness for Bitcoin and all of crypto. And we're moving on. This is going to be one of called the lost episodes. Isn't that right, Jesse? Uh, I think the lost was- episodes were when we go like technical, like somewhere in between TBP yeah. and hashing it out content we're Why are those lost? Them, man. oh it's just like it's like a you know like a phantom zone of like our transition because tbp is primarily informal non-technical and those make an attempt listen, to if you go listen to, to the that. shows throughout the history of this podcast you're going to catch some like heavy technical and like non-technical insight like throughout the mm. like from the beginning really I mean, the beginning sucked but like we were we were like Pretty on par with what was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. 
and like had reasonable insight of the future of this industry, I'd say, about the entire, entirety of this entire podcast. Were you talking about ZK proofs, though? They weren't relevant mm-hmm. back then. See? Okay, what was what was technical depth that was relevant at the time? Uh, I would say at that time, Not so fast. a good portion, we spent a lot of time on the 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 blockchain size debate, block size debate. Yes. Okay. And I spent a significant amount of time going into uh, why it was relevant, what the like factors were, who the players were, and why their opinions did or didn't matter. A lot of that nonsense. And like when then talking about SegWit, I went into depth multiple times on how SegWit fixes the answer or it was an attempt to fix the answer and how it worked and what you can expect. Like, like we went to like all the things. And also we talked about like the fact that what was the limiting factor back then was like on and off ramps. So back then like adoption mattered because no one could use it. No one knew about it. No one heard about it. And the reason was at that time is because you couldn't buy it. It was so hard to buy. And it was, if you had it, it was so hard to mm-hmm. sell. And so like it required a certain level of technical expertise just to even pretend that you could use it yeah so did you find that you always had more questions to answer after previous questions were resolved and the end was bitcoin is what it is today and it is still slow block size debate never got solved it's two different networks that are still continuing that argument yeah what's very funny is not funny but is um satoshi thought that a hard fork would be the beginning of the end of, of of a lot of things and it wasn't. I don't remember that. So he said that in the thing. He was like, a hard fork is potentially like a killer. Like, because it's he like called a it a last case scenario. But at the same time, he said things like, oh, we'll just update. We'll just like, whenever it gets to capacity, we'll just make the block size larger, which is a hard fork. So, like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, he clearly didn't understand the consequences or like the implications of like, that's a, another thing i think we've been pretty good about over the course of this podcast and that is like not deifying satoshi like yeah very true he made a lot of poor decisions but he knew that it was a community effort and it wasn't up to him to do everything and in fact i think i would like to think that's why he left is so that people weren't reliant upon him to make answers for something that's just that's much larger than him it's a good spot she to be in don't you think it they you just like mm-hmm. make yeah, something and then you you're like, you know what? Belgian clues. <laughs> Zim, I'm using all the pronouns. You don't know. We don't know what they were. <laughs> oh, you're like, God. You just make something and then throw your hands up and you're like, y'all do what y'all want to do. I'm out. Like, <laughs> oh, man. Or it was like, he was like, oh, shit, this is, this is big. I gotta go. I gotta go. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get him. Let me, let me ask you guys deal. this question. I'm gonna ask, start with you, D. Yes. What is your biggest takeaway from this whole journey? of bitcoin and and doing a podcast about bitcoin that's the biggest takeaway mm, you know me deosophy that could be a little segment that we come up with later sure i think that individuals have to constantly examine and re-examine themselves as they are hit with different things and i think people at mass have to constantly examine and re-examine themselves and most of the time learn the same lessons over I think that Bitcoin is just a reimagining of lots of things that we've done in the past. We just haven't found it in the history books yet. And I think that like every new generation, every few generations that comes along, they relearn the same lessons. Right. We've said a lot of things off cam slash mic today that are just ironic to me. We're like, oh, when it started, it was one computer, one boat. Well, you know, I'm sure like a lot of things start that are like, that's how they start. But then once it starts growing, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is totally different now. Right. And there's a phrase that I've heard quite a bit in the last few years of this, like, uh, just because this is along the lines of what I do in my personal life is a $1 million company doesn't run like a $500,000 company. To that end, a $3 million company doesn't run like a $1 million company. To that end, a $15 million company doesn't run like a $7 million company. And now we started with a free blockchain that's now worth a trillion dollars plus. So all that is involved with that is not going to work the same. The people aren't going to work the same together. They're not going to talk the same together. They're not going to build the same together. And as this entire industry grows and is more and more valuable with more and more participants, 
it is going, there's going to be so many emergences of reflavorings of disciplines that already exist. And that's what I've learned. I, in- I want to dig into that because that's a really interesting take. Um, Wait, can we, before we t- do that, can we, I'm going to, I'm going to make a note, but can I get your fundamental extraction from this whole process? Man, I really want to dive into that. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. Write it out though. Write it out in private chat real quick. Just to take a moment to <laughs> no, type it out. No, I'm not doing that. I'm going to, I'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what I took away from this is that communities are what matter. The like groups of people who care about something matters. And communities are dynamic in a real way. So like, the types of things that people care about within a given community changes based on how the community grows and adopts and changes and, and, and figures out how to deal with itself in the process of growth. When we first started, it was me, D and cello and our Facebook group bullshitting about the things we read on Reddit that week. Now I'm considered I could easily be considered an expert in this field that I'm serious about stuff. And we have, we're hiring people and we have a community of hundreds of people who care about what we say and contribute to it. Like how we participate in this community is drastically different. And that's based on how the community grew. And when you like think about that from the concept of like a blockchain, that's the only reason these things have value. And so like, I find that fascinating. And I want to, I, mean, I, can, I, will, I will, like, that's now what I want to live my life for is that concept of like, how do you allow communities to grow in a way that's best for the community and not extract value from them? Or if you do, like, I said this to Aaron, I said this to my brother, I was, I was in the driver of the car with him. He was actually like, what do you do? Like, I, I listen to your conversations all day because he's staying with me. And he's like, Yo, you're saying a lot of, like, you do a lot of shit. It's like, what's the point? And it's like, I, and it, after a period of trying to explain to him what my job is, it got to the point where like, I'm at an opportunity in my life to try and make money in a manner that's an overall good to people. I get to try and like become successful by not extracting value from other people. And I think that's cool. And the fact that it is valuable to do that, at least in today, like that skill set pays me well, is such an additional bonus that it's absurd. And it's like this podcast is what allowed me to explore and discover that. Mm. And you, Jesse? I just wanted to have fun with people. And The, the, like hanging out with D like since like shortly after I arrived in the price talk channel and was trying to like degen and trade crypto. And I, I was like all about, you know, what's the price today? You know, how, uh, mm-hmm. what's the price prediction? I was like one of those, uh, degens in like uh, wall street. You were bets. super degen. You're yeah. super degen. <laughs> and, and, <Tron. laughs> and, uh, you know, D I don't remember exactly how it came to be that like, like we did a show, we did a show called what the header. I don't even know how that spawned, but I know. I've known D to be very open-minded and like very willing to be at the start of like whatever, because he sees the potential for not only the people, but he also sees the potential for the idea, the potential. He just sees potential, right? And there are a lot of people who see potential in the Slack now, I think. Um, my fundamental takeaway from this whole experience, the whole journey of like, you know, recording that very first episode of what the header and then eventually hating it because it's so boring to just read off headlines. And then, you know, me being my background, you know, being what it is as an engineer, like I like doing technical like stuff. Right. So like Mm -hmm. the transition to, you know, looking under the hood of things on the application layer, then recently getting the opportunity to work with you, Corey, to do more infrastructure stuff. It's fun. All of it is fun. Like my takeaway from this whole space is that I get to do more of what I enjoy doing 
mm-hmm. uh, which is just hanging out with you guys, which is going to be no different as we transition to hashing it out and and learning and contributing meaningful work that matters to me in the same way that I think it matters to you. Mm-hmm. So that is that is my takeaway. Pretty good takeaways. Yeah, three solid takeaways. <laughs> Impromptu, very solid takeaways. I like hashing out because it's focused, and the older I get, the more focused I it, like. I it's like my body is drawn to something that's a little focused. In we're here to do this. Let's three, do this. Let's go away. <laughs> yeah, of the three things that like blockchain, this tech is, which is money, investment, and tech. I like to focus on the tech because those other two things you can get in other avenues, right? Like if you want to talk about, you know, money, you can go be a foreign exchange trader. If you want to talk about investments, you know, get on CNBC or is it MSNBC? I think it's CNBC. You know, which one is it? The money one. Crazy talker. It's CNBC. Yeah. It's get on CNBC and, that money you know, right listen to them talk about company TRZW and what their next quarter looks like and spending. I don't know. But tech is a unique thing that I've always loved. Right. It's like it's just fun to think about tech. Uh, you know, so I like that we're focusing there. But Corey, you were gonna rip my shit to shreds, so I want to hear it. No, I wasn't gonna rip it to shreds, but I think it's a it poses an interesting question in my head. And so what you just what you described was a company adapting itself and changing the way it operates and and focuses based on its need to grow it's it's growth yeah and i mentioned that kind of like that's that's somewhat of an inevitable thing like things need to change as you grow and your if your community changes based on growth and operations change on growth but we in which what we said also in the beginning was like in the beginning of blockchain we had this concept of one CPU, one vote, and ideals that really drove the whole thing to into existence to get people to care about something that didn't have value at that time. Mm-hmm. And I would say, over the course of the growth of the entire ecosystem, those ideals have waned considerably. At what yeah. point do we start giving a shit? At what point should we let go of ideals, or should we ever let go of ideals? Because we make compromises for growth, and those compromises are usually in the ideals that we set out for in the first place. Now, there's an argument to be made that since we made it permissionless, we allowed people to come in that didn't have those ideals mm-hmm. and the whole idea of being inclusive. So it wasn't like you have these ideals or else it's anyone can join and contribute. But like, this is a thing. Like, how long do you hold on to the principles and ethics that you set out to make something with in the pursuit of growth? Should you? When do you do them? What's what are reasonable compromises? Because like what we've seen is that people make compromises, and then in the consequence of momentum of growth, they never go back because it's too difficult, or they get ossified, or like they forget because triaging growth is hard. Yeah, I think that. I think there's. Um, I, let me continue real quick. This is not just a Web three or blockchain thing. It's like this. This is a. This is the reason why the internet is the way it is today, in my opinion. Like Facebook didn't set out to sell everyone's data to influence politics. That is a consequence of growth and restructuring itself to make profit over time, over a long period of time. You know what I mean? Like that's one of those things that happened because they found out like, oh shit, this is valuable. Let's just use this because it makes way more money. Let's restructure stuff. Like the internet didn't set out to optimize selling you advertisements. That was a consequence of growth and funding the whole thing. Yeah. And so like, I would argue that constantly capitulating to maintain growth will lead to the same shitty systems we have today. But growth is a part of a lot of people's systems. Like never ending growth is a part of 
of how people build that's that's how like how do the you're you're asking about changing like a century's worth of thought and practice and study on how to build a society like growth is something that like you can't just show up like for example you can't just show if you're an executive say you're an executive at a company you can't just show up to a board meeting and be like hey last year we made 15 million and this year guess what we're going to make 15 million boom done that's it Mm -hmm. like obvious obviously you know a, a rationally minded person would be like yeah that's enough we're all doing good we don't really need more like you got your percent we got our percents we're doing great but there's going to be that one asshole in the room that's like but what if we could get an extra couple mil hmm. and you're like really two more millions well we had 15 millions now we have 17 you say that's that's like <laughs> that's like i feel like that's like a human like thing where people will be like you know i think it's going from now times all the way to in the past times they were like hey we have That's one kind of river point, right why don't we find another river like this one river is look at what's going on here we got mills we got beer we got all this cool stuff we got livestock that's one river i bet you there's another river that way like <laughs> like i think that's like i've a got, human. I've got <laughs> three avenues to take this but i don't want to dominate conversation jesse you want to you got something here so so there's this concept that I heard some old people talk about today on YouTube, which is, and and these people are very successful by the standard metrics of success that society says you are successful, meaning they have had career impact. They have a shitload of money. And uh, I guess that's it, right? That's like society. Like those are the <laughs> things, right? Celebrities are like, oh, they have fucking good careers and they have a shit ton of money, right? So, so let's say, let's, let's just stop the factors there, right? So what I heard them say is that the people who can get to that, they have a certain degree of talent. So they there's this phrase that one of them says, which is talent outs. So um, whatever you choose to do, if you are competent enough, you can probably get there. And so um, whatever you choose to do, you know, whether you choose to pursue, you know, society's standard metrics of success and you have enough talent to get there, you probably do it. Um, it's just some people don't have those same metrics of success. Well, that's, I would question that. Like I would question the metrics of success and how important mm-hmm. they are because mm-hmm. most people, you know, I know a lot of rich people that have killed themselves. Mm-hmm. So clearly that isn't like, the one indicator of like what leads to a happy life, but we tend there, to lean towards it. And so like a degree of personal concept. growth that is more valuable and the relationships with people around that is worth more than the money involved in my opinion. That's what I'm trying to challenge is like what you said, D is like, yeah, there's like, there's always an asshole. that's like, what if we just get a little, get a little more, you just, just do this and get a little more. So like, we have this concept, at least in the West and increasingly everywhere else, is unmitigated growth is the goal. There is no end to how big we become. And I think that's stupid. It's unhealthy. It's cancerous. Yeah, it's, it is. It's, it's like, what is like, at least like unchecked, like unmitigated growth is stupid. It's understanding an equilibrium of like, this is what we set out to do and we're doing it. So we're just going to sustainably do it. Yeah. And understanding what growth you need to get to in the first place, and also understanding the level of compromise you're willing to have with respect to the goal, like the the initial reasoning behind setting out and doing it is important. Whereas right now, it's like growth, no matter what, throw everything out the window, we're growing. That's success. And since we've labeled it all as success, no one really questions it because whenever you like, quote unquote grow by standard metrics of success, everyone congratulates you, regardless of how shitty you feel for doing it. Mm-hmm. And like that is the standard and it's stupid. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
throw this out there and you guys can attack it or like it. I don't know. There's a certain level of privilege you get to where you can hold to ideals stronger than somebody who just needs to do whatever it takes to eat. Right. That's true. So, too. Um, for instance, if I, if my, if my ideal is to never steal, right. Uh, and I have enough, I have more than enough. Like I have food, I have shelter, I have all my basic needs satisfied. I can hold to that ideal versus maybe somebody who, like I'm talking about, there's, there's degrees of poverty, right? Aladdin, would you say Aladdin falls in this category? If you, if you'd like to pretend, so I'm, I'm using like sociological, sociologically relevant. Or shit, he stole bread because he had to. Yeah. So like, Sure. So absolute poverty, below absolute poverty, right? Meaning you you need to do whatever it takes because you will you you can't survive. You just literally have no not enough resources. You will die. So are are you able to are you allowed to steal? Like will you give that give yourself that concession? I I think that 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 is logical for a rational person to want to survive. There is this degree of like um there are people who will die for others and there are people who will not eat the bread and let you know their offspring or someone else's offspring eat the bread and they will die right it's like altruistic uh altruistic tendencies that kind of supersede the existence of that one individual so this privilege right there's a level of privilege going back to what i said there's a level of privilege you get to where you can actually hold to ideals is it is it an expectation for people who are above that level to think that the whole world, which is vastly at that level or below, is it a, is it a, is it a reasonable expectation to to expect that those people can follow them? I I say no. It is not if the world in which they live in does not allow them to survive based on those ideals. And right now it does not. And I'm, I would say, a casualty of this. Like, I am able to live the life I have with the ideals that I have because I am privileged. And expecting others to do the same is not realistic because the world that they live in does not allow for it. That's why I do what I do is to try and enable a world where it's more realistic for them to uphold the things I, the ideals yeah. that I care about while also like, paying their bills what i think the the end game here is and i had this like lightning bolt moment when we were talking offline is that um we're in a race to find a digital asset that can also be considered a public good not the I asset that's, i don't think it's I the think, asset that's the well, hold on good. i think it's the system yes that's it's what i'm public, saying uh, asset uh, or yeah. a how do you differentiate the two it's, i don't it's know a, it's a it's a public good. And the reason I say that is because when we were talking and you were like, uh, I just had this off lot and you said like, well, you know, it's supposed to be one computer, one vote. And, you know, this isn't owned by anyone. And then once you said that, I had this immediate mini skit in my mind of like, and I don't want to, I don't want to offend anybody out here, but this is just how it went. Like a native American, like, a, a, a you know, a pilgrim coming up to a native American and being like, Hey, how much for the tree? And the native Americans like, what are you talking about? All this is everyone's it's free. It does. This doesn't belong to us. This is nature. And then the pilgrim was like money in the bank, bro. Like, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I feel yeah. like is happening to crypto right now. We started this all and we were like, yeah, this is everyone. Yeah. No one owns this. And now the tech bros are in and they're like, money in the bank, bro. I'm just going to so, make this. <laughs> you're right. You know? You're right. And I think that. <laughs> I, I agree. So one of the initial. Sorry, you froze up, Jesse. Did you say something? No, I said I agree. Okay. Uh, some of the initial ideals of Bitcoin and crypto is making. I've said it a couple of times, like asshole resistance technology. So. In a world that you just described, was not that the asshole could do whatever he wanted, and it would impact a lot of people. See, but it was that though, because the the Native <laughs> Americans had assholes too. They just treated them different, and there was a different set well, of rules. They would be like, "Oh, you're." I mean, an that asshole. wasn't very global. It was local, right? So, like, yeah, 
it was a locally asshole resistant community, but someone we have external forces that just like, nah, bro, we don't play by those rules. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, I think that's the goal is to make something that's asshole resistant that everyone like external forces can't do that type of thing. Now, is that realistic? I'm not gonna say yes, but like that's that's the end, end attempt in my opinion is that to make it such that that can't happen based on the way the like societal fabric is constructed and because it's constructed that way already making something that does that that doesn't allow assholes to be powerful may be impossible because they're not going to let it happen and you need to get to a certain size like if you look at my like as an example uh bitcoin got to the size that it did in a asshole free way arguably because uh no one cared you can't do it again like the next year any, saw it then like <laughs> anytime now, now that now that blockchain and proof of work is like you can ask your grandma and she'll say i heard of bitcoin like you can't start <laughs> a proof of work you can't start a traditional proof of work chain and it not be com- immediately like compromised based on people understanding the value of those things and taking it over and, and growing to the size of Bitcoin, growing to the size of Bitcoin because we're aware of how that stuff works. It, it sub like subverted the assholes until it got to a point where they, they can no longer have power. Can't do that again, at least with proof of work. Mm -hmm. And so like it got lucky. So that's the only way it's ever going to be able to grow is because it was able to subvert the assholes before they found out how to break it. So Maybe. who are assholes? Is that like, like when we say oh, my, my, def- right? oh, my definition of asshole yeah, what is, is, that? is someone who does something against the morals of a community for personal gain that is overwhelmingly detrimental to the whole. So a leech. So, yes. A yes. leech is okay. A leech that ruins the community is not. Okay. Got it. Like, you're always going to have leeches, but if they don't have impact on the overall dynamics of the community, at least like individually. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, you're misconstruing what a leech is, right? So, a leech, like, so a free rider is different than a leech. A, a leech parasite. actually extracts. Yeah, exactly. Like, a leech, like the actual leech. Is a parasite. You always have leeches, but like you can't make it economic sustainable to be a leech and sustain yourself, like on a on a whole, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like if you build a system where like thirty percent of the community is leeches and they're able to live, that's a problem. You've built a shitty community or a shitty pro, or a shitty platform. You got a few of them and they kind of get by, then yeah, that's probably going to be a consequence of things. So, like my 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 theory is, you have to be an open minded talented hipster to see these things before they happen and to see shitty games that you don't want to play and then you go oh i think i can make a better game because that game's kind of shitty thoughts mm. i mean i guess if you take like the raw definitions of those words <laughs> I, 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 has I, a <laughs> derogatory connotation or like a certain, really? like, mental image hipster has a certain image okay okay like like uh okay fine um yeah re- like it, remove the stigma of all of the words does it is it okay like is that what you meant by raw definitions yeah Okay. But you can't take raw definitions. Everybody knows. I mean, we just did. We, 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 we pulled all of so, the baggage so, and we just said raw definition. This is, this is something that I actually get talked to about quite frequently by my brother, my real blood brother in life. We talk every day, which is now I'm realizing it's a very fortunate relationship to have with someone. Every but day? We talk every day. Every single day, we have at least like a one minute conversation. Talks right? to almost baby. no one every day. Baby, didn't I, I talk, talk to, to my wife day? every day? Yep. You barely talk to your wife every day. Oh, I, I, I live with her. her. Uh, anyways, so he says, he tells this to me because I've been trying now for a decade as his younger brother, been trying to explain to him crypto. And it's a never ending battle because crypto evolves at the pace of an alien in the movie Aliens. Like, First, it's busting out of your chest. Next thing, it's eating your whole fucking crew. And that's like the next day. 
right? So it's like, and that's a that's a pretty good analogy. But anyways, um, he's like, when you talk to me, and I hope you're not talking to other people like this, but when you talk to me, it's like 10th grade physics AP class and everything is in a vacuum. And then once you get to senior level physics class, you learn nothing is in a vacuum and things change. And then Corey, you literally having a PhD in physics. Yeah. All that stuff about being in a vacuum, that's way wrong. It's a okay way to start things, but yeah, it's basically, you basically throw that out the window, just throw it out the window and here's the real math. And then you drop it on someone's plate and they're like, what the fuck? What is air friction? This isn't supposed to, what do you mean the air friction changes? Like, so that's what I'm saying is like, when we talk about these things and we just use the raw definition, that's not really fair because we're talking about things in like a vacuum. And if things, you know, like crypto, Bitcoin was supposed to do this in a vacuum that works, but, you know, get a few billion people using it. Bitcoin's not going to work. That's, a, that's what's interesting, right? Is like it works so well in the vacuum. And as we've watched these networks grow, and then see external forces applied to them because they're finally interesting to them. We get to see like what we thought was real kind of crumble or break or bend and the parts that like were resilient actually be resilient. And that's really interesting because we've actually built really resilient systems. Bitcoin hasn't gone down ever. Like that's really impressive. Yeah, it is. That's, that's very impressive. And so, like, and neither we're able to learn. Yeah, we're able to learn a lot of lessons on, like, well, actually, like, some of this actually works pretty well, and there's something to it. But like, it's still so early that we're still watching stuff break, like, yeah. devastationally based on like <laughs> early assumptions. <laughs> what you say? Just... We've realized, like, what I posted in random channel today, that when things get too big. They include too many people that probably co-op things in the wrong direction, right? And mm -hmm. I think that if you make a system where people are able to kind of like gracefully make their own like circle, new circles, rather than be forced to be part of that big circle, then maybe things might be better. Allow fragmentation, but the ability to re-merge when useful, maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 something that that's a lesson we've learned, I'd say, uh, over time. G has to drop off for apparently a second. Uh, okay. Like a lesson we've learned, which we'll get into. I think the earlier new episodes of hashing it out when that show drops is like how we scale isn't how we like how we should scale isn't how we originally thought we should scale because if you look at like bitcoin and like i remember in the early days of bitcoin it was just like this is money this is everything's going to be built on this this is going to replace finance going to replace banks and replace everything and then like eventually it was like ah, i don't want it's not going to do that like it just forcing everyone into a single system based on a single set of rules isn't reasonable and you can't scale that system based on how it like based on how Bitcoin works. And then you look, then you saw like Ethereum try it. I'm like, hey, okay, we're not the full system, but like, you know, we build tokens on top of it and they're on their own little communities. And you watch tokens die because the success of Ethereum forced them, like forced them to not be able to use their currency because it costs too much. And so it's like, all right, so like I'm a community that can no longer operate because the prices of Ethereum are too high. So everything I've built up to this point is worthless because of something outside of my existence. And that's because you forced everyone into a single circle, right? On the same technology. And so what we've seen happen from there is a bunch of different blockchains trying to create their own communities and then build reasonable bridges across them. And we find problems there in terms of like, how do we bridge so that people don't lose all their money? Still don't figure that out yet. And so like gradually we are figuring out the proper way to scale groups of people caring about things and then how to interlink them when those cares overlap. I think that's fun to watch, but like, like, like you said, like in the process of learning these lessons, because 
in my opinion, it's also money and the hype is over, over, overdrawn. A lot of people get hurt real bad. Like, look at, like, I'm curious to see how many people's regular people's lives have been devastated because of poor assumptions and education on how we're trying to scale this technology. Right? Like, it's hurting people when something like Luna goes down. And us trying to figure out how to make a stable coin and then hurting people costs like significant real world damage. Like which which is more which is more important. Granted, that's maybe a poor choice because I'm a little fucked up in terms of how it was made. But like I'd say the pricing going down in Bitcoin or Ethereum based on a real bug or like a legitimate project going down because of a real problem, ruining someone's life is a real world cost. I don't know way that. I think I think that again I'm back. if you were rich enough such that if you if you were like um what's the dude's name who had the tattoo on his arm that everybody was circulating of Novogratz Mike Novogratz, Novogratz. right so for people who are on that level of wealth who like essentially 3 billion of luna turned into $3000 or something like that ooh, ooh, you are ooh. you are totally okay right you're like oh Oh, that's a tattoo. I'll keep it. Reasonably speaking, your life didn't change too much. Exactly. You're still able to feed your family. Who did, who like they had, I don't know, like say tens of thousands of dollars and that was their whole life savings. I think forgiveness of people who are trying to innovate technology is part of what you need to understand. But then you also need to understand if you're gambling like that, that's on you. Bottle plus, baby. What did I miss? We got Z deep. Did we get pretty deep? Talking about impacts of like you make shit and it and it breaks. We try we try to make things scale and work. And in the process of failing, we like severely impact real people's lives. That's that's mm-hmm. where crypto is is most dangerous as it as it I mean like this didn't happen. This is the first time I'd say that the impact has bled into regular people's lives as much as it has in crypto because it's so, it's so inclusive. Like people were not, I don't know. I, maybe it's percentages, maybe not, but like in terms of like raw damage to like humans investing in crypto and then losing significant portions of their wealth, probably the largest. Mm-hmm. Like, like people who were subject to this previously, at least in the United States, were like accredited Enron. investors. What about Enron? Maybe. What about um? What about dot com era? So, like the dot com era was interesting because it was a technology that required like that didn't like the technology wasn't money itself. I don't think. But it the was IPOs as easy to ICOs, right? How, how easy was it to buy these things for regular people? It's I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I wasn't. I was barely alive. I don't know the answer to that. Like, how easy it was it to buy stock into these into the dot com bubble, and then get wrecked when it all fell apart, except for like you know a couple companies. I think the scale was really right. easy to buy shit in crypto. Hmm. I think the scale and the speed at which you can access crypto because of the internet and, and it's very democratic in that regard. Like you can have a really shitty phone and you can still, if you can type www and get to a website and you know, you can pull out a credit card. Why do you type in www these days? Okay. Oh my God. Don't be like that. <laughs> uh, there's people out there. They're still typing in www. So I think you're right. Okay, I'll agree with you. I'll concede that point. I wanted to push back, but I, I was I was like, you know, like I'm thinking like tulips, like like speculation on like, you know, 
precious metals. Like it's pretty no, substantial. I, yeah, it's pretty fast. Is, the, the rate at which is, you can lose your shit is fast, and the way, rate at which you can get in is fast too. I think I, that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say like, it's so close to gambling. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Like legit. Like we. People, the word you hear is invests across the board it is fucking gambling and it is humans are incredibly susceptible to gambling some way more than others it's a cardinal sin isn't it (laughs) it's the closest thing to gambling i've ever seen in my entire life that's as accessible as it is yep like children can do it because there's no rules yep it's worse than like the the shitty click games you have on your on the on the app store that children rack up. Yeah. In terms of like accessibility of losing money, maybe mm-hmm. not because they have bank accounts. Like, ch- like your parents aren't making their children a, bank, a Coinbase account, but like you don't need a Coinbase it, account. Remember, I told you anecdotally, twelve year olds were trading. Yeah, like yeah. the uh, level of inclusivity is so high that. Mm-hmm. Anyone can get access to it, get addicted to it, and then lose a bunch of money. And the narrative that we hear <laughs> doesn't warn people of that. Yeah, Jesse keeps pointing at himself for those who are listening. Yeah. Jesse's clean cleaned up since the back in those days. He used to have long hair and uh meth lips. But what, so like, that's also right part now. of that. I What's think that's it's also at? part of the that's also part of the original thing that I was mentioning in the, in the first part, right? Like the ideals, the original ideals of all this, like all of this stuff was like maximal inclusive in, inclusivity. How do we allow people to participate who never had access before? And some would argue that's bad. Yeah, we're we're reeling it back. We have to, dude. It's almost like this. Like this is what I was going to say. And do I'm we sorry, though? Do we have to? Deep, not, or do we this just? This is why we have to. We like, this is, I'm saying we have split. to. You just have multiple directions no, of me, like. Let me give my opinion. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. There's the reason why this stuff is fascinating and also just makes you feel weird sometimes is that I am in the camp that thinks that money is technology. Right? There's a lot of people that would argue with me. In fact, people with PhDs, historians would argue with me. I think that money is a technology. I think most the thing that makes it unique is that it's a technology that has to be massively inclusive. Some technologies don't have to be and should not be for good reason. For example, we can't have ever the reason why we haven't gotten to a flying car, ladies and gentlemen, is not because we don't have the thinking power to do it. It's because everybody and their mom doesn't need to be flying a car. All we're just going to get is explosions in the sky and dead bodies raining down on everyone. Like, that's just where that goes. Maybe if we can design robots that can fly cars, that's when we get flying cars and we can trust those robots. That's when we get flying cars. But right now, it doesn't need to be inclusive. We don't let everybody in the cockpit. Not everybody gets to use that technology. Not everybody gets to use 35-ton trucks that drive around in a construct, not a construction yard, like in a quarry. It's exclusive. You got to have rights or certifications, sorry, not rights, certifications skills. and licenses, skills to use that technology. Money has layers of it where, yeah, you got to have licenses and skills to use that layer of that, that money, right? But if you don't have the licenses and skills, you just don't get access to that cool stuff. And that's what makes money a unique and different technology because it's like, it's got to be massively inclusive. It has to be. It's, it's, it's required. To it's live required. Your life. Yeah. But at the same time, there's certain stuff certain people just don't get to do because it can be pretty it's damaging. Risky. It's risky. Right. And so it's like, like leverage. Leverage is risky. And not being able to understand that leverage means you're probably going to lose it. Yeah. Like I saw a tweet just Monday where it was Crypto Dog, which I'm glad that I got to meet this person in real life. Random. <laughs> God, that was so random. Anyways, uh, and now he's the Crypto Dog. I was like, it's so funny. He's like, yeah, I run this Twitter and I'm a dog and everybody loves it. And I was like, 
cool man <laughs> whatever dude <laughs> like <laughs> now he's the crypto dog but somebody tweeted they're like uh I just lost over, you know, six figures worth of money. And he was like, dude, it's not even a big deal. You're three trades, hundred X leverage. You'll be back there tomorrow. And I was like, God, that's a guy that's so balls deep in these markets that he is willing to say something like that with confidence and know he can execute it. And it's like, yeah, he's got a very particular set of skills. If I trade something at hundred X right now, I'm off a bridge. I'm off, like, I will lose, I will lose it all. And it's like, well, there goes, Decades of hard work gone. Let me go ahead and take a bender off this bridge real quick and just <laughs> alleviate this. But like, if you don't, and that's the thing about money in this tech, especially that makes it so unique is it is technology, but it's like, it's inclusive and exclusive at the same time. Like if you don't know what you hell, man, like I have people I know who are scared, too scared to send one transaction. They're like, you know, when I say things to them like, hey, if you put if you don't put this in right, you're going to send your money into nowhere land. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, I don't mean that any other way. If you if you don't put this in right, <laughs> your money's gone. You're going to send it into nothingness. And they were like, yeah, I can't. This is I can't just can you push the button for me? And I'm like, I'm not going to push the button for you. This is part of learning. You've got to push that button. And they're like, just this doesn't feel. Ah. And you know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, how do we expect to include everyone, but <laughs> exclude others? Like that's I just don't I don't get it. And if, if you don't we have can... to, you don't have to include. Like when you when when a person there there are, there are different people who are curious enough to go. Okay, let me just see what happens, and let me be smart enough, like that I'm not going to send my whole lump sum of my account in that one go. If I know that there's a potential to lose it. I'm probably going to send like the small amount, smallest amount possible, right? And then and then start from there. And if that makes it, then maybe I can send a larger amount, right? There's a degree of confidence and a degree of curiosity and a degree of like I just want to see what happens that people jump into crypto to explore had in the beginning. And now with the advent of tech bros are kind of like uh, so that's a lot of money to just do that one thing. I, I don't know. <laughs> I have a question for you guys specifically, and this aligns with what you do on your day jobs. How long should something be internally um, used and taken through the ringer before it becomes a practice that is wide, wide spanning? What I mean by that is this. Banks have probably been four decades sending test transactions to banks as wires, right? They've probably been like, oof, international wire. I could get a cue wrong on this one and we got a bad day. We got news reporters in here. How about I send you 50 cents first bank and you tell me if it got there and then I'm going to send the rest. And I say that because that's how like most banking apps work. When you link your bank, they're like, okay, we're going to send some test transactions. We're going to send you a 17 cent transaction and a 27 cent transaction. Verify that it's there. And you say, yep, boom, this is what you got. Okay. And they're like, cool, connection, set, good. We don't need to worry about this anymore. And if we ever do again, you'll hear from me. So like what, what amount of years in testing goes in to say, okay, this is good. Let's, this is a new practice. This is what we're going to do. Um, like every complicated answer, that answer is depends. Mostly on risk. So like how much money is involved? There's a stake in the process of doing this action. Uh, what are the consequences of it failing? And what mitigations do we have in place to, keep this from happening and how confident are we with those mitigations? And so like you have to take a bunch of things into factor to make a decision on whether or not a process is solid and doesn't need to be re like revisited again, or like can be broadcasted more globally such that people who don't understand the whole thing can use it safely. And, and like that, I've talked about this a lot internally at status and externally too. It's like, it's, it's the, because we've given so much responsibility to the end user in this ecosystem, 
like the, the, the off the, the consequence of inclusion is offloading responsibility to the end user. They're now fully in charge of their value. And there's no way for the people to like give it back to them if they lose it or fuck it up or shoot themselves in the foot. So as developers who of the technology that gives them this power and responsibility, it's our response. It, it is, it is solely up to us to make sure that they have the right information to make decisions for themselves appropriately for their situation or, and also set appropriate defaults so that it's difficult to shoot yourself in the foot unless you know what you're doing. And that's a really hard thing to do. Yeah. And so like, it was very easy to, for banks to do this because they're like, we control it all. We'll just take it back. Yeah. Like, what, like, what do you got? Like, oh, we screwed up. Here's your money back. Cause it's just the number we control. Yeah. And so like, and so like when you have services that have all of the power and they allow people access to it, then it's easier for them to kind of dole out a process to the end users because if the user fucks it up, they're like, uh, fill out a support ticket. We'll fix it for you. But like in a situation like crypto and decentralized technology, that's not the case. We don't, we don't, we're, we're actively removing our ability to do that. And then trying to find a way for to educate people to manage that themselves. And that's really difficult because a lot of people don't give a shit. But like to answer your question initially, like they don't have to care because we're giving people options to care. And they can use a different service built on top of it that like removes their ability to care by offering a service to them. Coinbase is an example of this. We've said it a bunch of times. Like the goal isn't to force everyone to do this. The goal is to give people options to do it if they want to. Whereas right now they don't have that option. So we got a lot of steps to take. That's for danger. Yeah. At least Jesus, that's my goal. <laughs> so right, we- let's wrap it up. Oh, I was about to open up a whole nother can. Oh, we no, got our we're there. almost there. All right. So we're going to do our wrap up thing is we hope you enjoy this episode of us. One of the lost episodes. One of the uh, later episodes. Join the patron. Become a patron. Right. Right now it's the Patreon doc. Not the, I do that every time. Patreon.com slash the Bitcoin podcast. You'll see us. Uh, you can become a patron. There's different tiers. You'll get different things. Uh, we can say that becoming a patron now before the transition, hashing it out, uh, is probably best, you know, and it helps us, you know, keep the lights on. As you can see, it's pretty dark where I am. And I'm the one that, of the three of us that needs the most light. So you could become a patron and help us help you, you know, shout out to, to yes to crypto for always being a supporter for all of these years. Um, Thank you, Wayne. Join, join the Slack. Why are you doxing him, bro? Why are you doxing no. him? What do you mean? It's a, it's a first name. It's a very common first name. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I didn't want to. Just, uh, oh, okay. So oh, okay. Join the Slack. Come to the BitcoinPodcast.com. Press the button that says Slack. Join the Bitcoin Podcast Slack, which will be also reprogrammed yeah, uh, to hashing it out Slack. All right, we're just gonna we're gonna pull Indiana Jones on you guys, right? You're going to think you got a gold totem and you just got a bag of sand. Well, it's opposite of way. You know what I'm saying? We're just going to switch it out and hope you never mind. This analogy fell apart. It's a movie. Go watch it uh, on your podcast app. Give us five stars or hearts or microphones or circles. I don't know whatever the app has on it to give podcast ratings, but give us one of the good ones. Right. And if you don't feel like give us a good one, you could just not listen again. That, that you know. You don't got to go out of your way to say, ah, I didn't enjoy this. Just don't listen again, you know? What else we got? Oh, shout outs. I'm going to miss shout outs. Not a lot, but a little. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Michael B. Jordan. Uh, sorry it didn't work out, man. I know you and her right there. Uh, Lori Harvey, go in. Shout out to you, Lori Harvey, you know? You know, y'all just had irreconcilable differences, you know. Sometimes it doesn't work out. 
shout out to you, Doja Cat. You know, all that dye in your hair is probably going to damage your roots. I learned that recently on a trip I took. You got to take care of your scalp, girl. All right, on to the next one. Shout out to you, Kendrick Lamar. You look like you're taking care of your scalp, right? And you're also topping the charts with creepy AI music videos. Shout out. Ah, that's a little Nas X. His shoulder, there's no way his shoulders are that wide. That's got to be the jacket. But Heart shout shot. out to you, dude. Ah, shout out to man. Crypto <laughs> for being the perfect analogy <laughs> for the movie Alien. And anyone who's building in this space, let's go back to the Alien picture for just a second. If you're building in the space and you're watching this podcast, look at that picture. Look at it, because that's what you're getting yourself into. All right. You're going to launch your little thing. It's going to be great. And the next thing you know, it's eating your crew. Right. And that's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what's going on in crypto right now. You're like, oh, it's, you know, just little. Now it's big. All right. Let's go to the next one. Who we got? Ah, <laughs> there we go. We got old long neck and wide smiles, Zoe Saldana. You know, really, it's the proportion of neck to smile, which just just slingshotted you into the stratosphere of fame. Right. And, you know, don't be so mad that you got typecast into playing different color skinned aliens. Right. Doesn't matter. You're still getting paid. Right. Everybody saw your good roles in Drumline and, you know, in that show about ballerinas. But now we get to watch you as giant blue aliens for the rest of our life. And you're still getting paid. So don't be mad. Zoe, don't be mad. All right, is that the last shout out? Hope I she hope hears so. my. Hope she hears my. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, I got like one more it. shout out. Oh, shout out to Meemaw. Forgot to give her a hug on the way out. Just let her know, Corey, that I said that for people here. There you go. All right, that's it. Play the outro.